Some Papuans did not even know Indonesians existed until the early 2000s. That's particularly crazy because according to the rest of the world, they're Indonesian. Of course, other Papuans like the Biak Papuans were all too aware and raised the West Papuan flag in protest, camping by it for six days in 1998. The Indonesian military not only then came and shot at the demonstrators, but then did this. So over 100, we've been headed to aboard two ships and taken offshore and the torture take place and then bodies were thrown overboard. When those bodies washed onto the shore, the Indonesian military claimed it was from the Atape tsunami. That happened 1,000 kilometers away. The Indonesian government then engaged in a program of diluting the proportion of Papuans living in Papua. Having made up nearly 100% of the province, Papuans now only make up 50%. However, at the same time as all of this, Indonesia was withdrawing from East Timor, with Indonesia famously calling it a pebble in the shoe. So why then are they desperate not to lose Papua? Indonesia wants West Papua. I say let them have the cannibal land and keep the Soviets at bay. It's really hard to overstate just how depressingly crazy the West Papua story is. And one of the craziest aspects is that I'm recording this video here, which means I broadly get the same news and education as people from here. But most of us know nothing of West Papua. And we're gonna see that that's no coincidence. Now, to understand this, we've gotta begin with the island of New Guinea. So this right here is the second largest island in the world. And in the beginning, the New Guinea story is kind of similar to Australia. The Dutch rock up on the western side, decide that it's overhyped, and then let the British have the rest. Though this time, the Brits had to share it with Germany. For Eastern New Guinea, long story short, Australia took over both, and then in 1975, Papua New Guinea became an independent country. But I wanna go back to the West. The Dutch always viewed Western New Guinea as a hindrance rather than an asset. By the mid 1900s, no gold reserves had been found and it wasn't good for agriculture, so it became a neglected colony. The one function of Dutch New Guinea was that it was a buffer state between Britain and their prized spice islands. But I'm gonna skip ahead to the 50s. Dr. Van Hoek, as Minister for Economic Affairs, he refused Japan the oil she needs. Sabotage has seen that Japan will still be denied. So Indonesia had now gained independence from the Dutch, but there was still a massive unresolved issue. Did they get Papua as well? Indonesia argued that it was far more Indonesian than Dutch territory, and the Dutch argued that they at least shared the same religion, Christianity, in contrast to Indonesia's Islam. Of course, many Papuans themselves were saying that they were neither, and in fact their own country. What's really interesting is that in 1961, the Dutch let the Papuans establish a West New Guinea Council with an agreement to hold a plebiscite on the status of the territory. Now, one of the interesting things with Indonesia was that its president, Sakano, was on pretty good terms with the Soviet Union, and so with Soviet soldiers, Sakano launched Operation Trakoa, a pretty extensive occupation of Dutch Papua. Remember, this is the Cold War in the 1960s, and America freaked out at the thought of Soviets exerting their influence in the area, so they frantically tried to negotiate a settlement. Kennedy got some advice from some key people, both called Robert. Robert Comer was Kennedy's CIA advisor and was very clear that negotiations had to favor Indonesia, saying a pro-bloc, if not communist Indonesia, is an infinitely greater threat than Indo possession of a few thousand miles of cannibal land. The second guy was called Robert Lovett. He was an on and off again director of a massive mining company called Freeport. Technically, he didn't advise Kennedy on the deal, but he did advise Kennedy to hire a guy called McGeorge Bundy as his national security advisor. Like Comer, Bundy encouraged Kennedy to make it a very pro-Indonesian deal. Something smelling dodgy here, right? Well, there's more. Bundy then negotiated for Indonesia's top general, a guy called Sahado, to do an exploration into the Papuan highlands for gold mines. If you don't know Indonesian history, Sahado then launched a successful coup against Sukarno. However, he actually blamed the communists for the coup and said that he needed to take action to defend Sukarno. He gave regular broadcasts to Indonesia and angry crowds then executed between 500,000 and 2 million Indonesians who were even remotely tarred with a communist brush. Indonesia had now been peeled off as a US ally. I'm getting ahead of myself. That was in 1965. The New York Agreement was settled back in 1962 and it was heavily pro-Indonesia. Indonesian were given Papua on one condition, 
By 1969, Papuans had to vote on whether they wanted independence or Indonesia. Of course, Indonesia waited until 1969 to actually hold the vote, and America was cool with that because Indonesia was now a friend. In 1967, Freeport even signed a deal with Suharto, and it is quite frankly astonishing. According to Suharto, Freeport had, quote, broad powers over the local population and resources, including the right to take on a tax-free basis land, timber, water, and other natural resources, and to resettle indigenous inhabitants while providing reasonable compensation. Think about this from Freeport's point of view. A foreign government is giving you license to take their resources and do whatever you want to make that happen. You couldn't imagine such favourable conditions and so they needed to ensure Indonesia won in 1969 and they needed to use that window to, no pun intended, strike gold. And that's when they found Hertzberg and then Grasberg. Now, there was some knowledge about this mine, but no one knew just how rich these reserves were. So Grasberg and Erzberg are two mines that are about three kilometres apart in the mountains of Papua. Erzberg was founded first, and then in 1988, Freeport moved across to Grasberg, and this was huge. Based on available reserves, it's the biggest gold mine in the world right now, and the second biggest copper mine. Based on the percentage of global production, it's already been the third most used gold mine and the ninth most used copper mine. In other words, Papua was sitting on perhaps the world's biggest treasure. By the late 60s, Freeport saw its potential and started construction on a mine. Again, Suharto was cool with this because America was supporting him, and he didn't really have the money to build quite a complex mine. But hold up, remember that referendum that had to happen in 1969? You know, the one that only Papuans could vote on? The act of free choice that was part of the New York Agreement? Well, 1969 came, and Indonesia couldn't delay things anymore. Now, in defense of Indonesia, they were never going to be able to get 100% of Papuan adults to vote. Remember, some Papuan tribes were yet to be contacted by this point. But what happened was not even a remotely fair alternative. 1,025 Papuans were gathered by the Indonesian army across different locations in the country. For reference, this was out of 800,000 eligible Papuans. The only foreign journalist, Australian Hugh Jun, reported that the Indonesian army coerced votes against independence and removed Papuans protesting the nature of the vote before he himself was then threatened at gunpoint. The UN Secretary General, Ulthant, appointed someone called Fernando Ortiz Sanz to be his representative at the referendum, and Ortiz Sanz said that 95% of Papuans wanted independence. So surely then the independence vote got up. Well, actually, the 1,025 representatives unanimously voted for Indonesia. The UN said that both parties in the agreement recognised the vote, and by both parties they meant Indonesia and the Netherlands. No, Papua didn't count as a relevant party. So this was not only a big win for Indonesia, but a huge win for Freeport. It meant their gravy train was safe. Of course, the Papuans were not in agreement with this and decided to get organized, forming the OPM, Organisasi Papua Merdeka, which translates as the Free Papua Movement. So in 1971, a West Papuan Republic was declared with even a drafted constitution. Now, obviously, it'd be an understatement to say that it was a mismatch between the OPM and the Indonesian army. So the OPM actually then reached out to Freeport for help. When Freeport refused, they decided that they'd be the target of attack. In 1977, OPM forces snuck into Erzberg and slashed pipes, cut cables, and burned down a warehouse causing $120,000 in damage. In response, Indonesia then used American planes to bomb the Bali and Valley, killing 4,146 Papuans, according to the Australian Human Rights Commission. From 1978 until 1998, pro-Papuan groups raised all sorts of concerns of Indonesian massacres, including the 1984 assault of Nagasawa Orma Kessel village in which 200 Papuans were killed, and the naval shelling of Toronto, Taka, and Masi Masi coastal villages. The OPM then went to tactics like hostage negotiations, such as the 1996 Mapanduma hostage crisis. After that 1998 flag raising ceremony that I showed you before, the Indonesian government once again cracked down on the OPM. Now, the early 2000s was also the era of the commodities boom, meaning that Grasberg was now even more valuable. Should the OPM not be dealt with, then more attacks could happen on Grasberg. So the Indonesian government passed something called the Special Autonomy War. 
It was basically an attempt to buy off Papuan resistance by promising more mining profits, more seats in local parliament, and giving them a special autonomy fund. The OPM simply responded by raising the flag, which I don't need to say was equivalent to them raising something else. Now, plenty of battles and regrettably massacres have happened in these last two and a half decades, and this video right here gives you an excellent rundown of what it's been like on the ground. But I want to turn to Indonesia's strategy. Papua will have three new provinces. The government also claims that 82% of Papuans want regionalization in Papua. So Indonesia has long adopted a policy of transmigration, i.e. moving people out of high density areas and into low density areas. Just look at Java. You've got 150 million people living here. However, the other parts of Indonesia haven't taken well to what they call Javanization. That's because they receive so many Javan migrants that they feel colonized by them. Of course, Indonesian occupied New Guinea provided the perfect place to send Javans. This lasted from the New York agreement up until 2015 when President Wadodo promised to ditch transmigration in Papua. At that point, Papua had a 50-50 split of Papuan and Indonesian people. However, we then saw a lot of internal migration towards the capital, Jayapura. This has completely watered down Papuan autonomy over the land. In 2006, Indonesia made another move on Australia. So in 2006, 43 West Papuans fled on an outrigger canoe right here to Cape York in Australia. By receiving these refugees, Australia was giving legitimacy to the persecuted status of West Papuans in Indonesia, and Indonesia then withdrew their ambassador. Concerned at the deteriorating state of relations, the two then signed a treaty on the island of Lombok in 2006. The treaty says that both nations will respect each other's territorial integrity and not support secession movements in each other's countries. Regrettably, American and Australian weaponry has been crucial in suppressing the OPM, and by 2019, tensions were starting to quiet. That was until August. Disrespecting the Indonesian flag. During their detention, a group of people hurled racial abuse at them, calling them monkeys and dogs. What happened in Surabaya was racist, and that has triggered Papuans today to call for a referendum against Indonesia. After incidents of police racism to Papuan students, demonstrations spread across not just Papua, but to Jakarta too, where the Morning Star was raised. As per usual, the Indonesian police swiftly cracked down on this, with Australia offering their support to Indonesia. This is a matter that the UN is dealing with the current human rights uh, investigation, and that's got the full cooperation of the Indonesian government, and we'll uh, await for the outcomes of that process. In 2022, Jakarta went back to Politics 101, divide and conquer. So previously, Indonesian New Guinea was split into two provinces, Papua and West Papua. However, so many Papuans under the one local government was a risk. Instead, placing them under different governments would make organization much harder, and so three new provinces were added so that it looked like this. So if Indonesia has so clearly exerted itself in Papua, and if there's so many mining interests invested in keeping it that way, what hope is there for the OPM? Well, some have proposed merging with Papua New Guinea. Interestingly, this was Australia's official government policy until America made them drop it in the 1960s. However, right now, any effort to unify would see Papua New Guinea massively antagonize Indonesia and Australia, its two most powerful allies. Their Prime Minister, James Marape, even said that they had no right to comment on human rights abuses in West Papua. So if West Papua is to have any chance of self-determination, it needs outside help. The only nations to have taken up West Papua's cause have been other Pacific islands. Not only is this an issue of Melanesian Brotherhood, but Grasberg represents their greatest threat climate change. So in 2016, seven nations raised concerns about Indonesian treatment of Papuans at the UN. This is a speech from the president of the Solomon Islands, Manasseh Sokovare. I apologize about the stream lag, but the words are interesting. Human rights violations in West Papua and the pursuit for self-determination of West Papua are two sides of the same coin. If you've been following this channel, you'd know just how important the Solomon Islands has become to China recently, with Sokovare getting the red carpet treatment. You can listen to this pod for the full background. Chinese and, and Sogavare, they signed a Sino-Solomon security deal. Obviously, the OPM has no chance of winning the actual war, but it can win the PR war. I think Palestine is living proof that the PR war still matters, as we've seen numerous governments shift their stance in the last few months. 
If enough people become literate in the basic history behind the West Papuan story, let's say it gets 30% of the attention that Gaza has gotten, well then firstly these Pacific governments actually have something of value to go to China with to try and apply pressure. But secondly, it might have some luck in changing the tune of at least some Western governments who then try to get concessions from Indonesia. You might think that Western governments don't care. Well, they don't care because guys like me grew up right next to Papua with absolutely no knowledge of the ongoing war or the sham vote of free choice. There's no incentive for them to care. But imagine if the public had any level of consciousness of what we do about Gaza. Imagine if West Papua was on the table of serious foreign policy issues that an Australian politician had to answer for at the time of an election. Imagine if Four Corners covered that instead of beating up on David McBride. If you don't know the story, he blew the whistle on serious war crimes in the Australian army and the ABC who then used that to break the story hung him out to dry. You can learn all about his crazy trial where he faces life in prison right here.